If there will be a vaccine that is effective, it's very important that that vaccine becomes a global public good, a people's vaccine, something that is affordable and accessible to everybody in the world. Hello and welcome to the G0 World Podcast, where you'll find extended versions of the interviews from my show on public television. And today, I'm taking a look at the largest intergovernmental organization in the world. This year, the United Nations turns 75, a diamond anniversary. But when it comes to solving some of the biggest issues today, has the UN lost its luster? I'm talking to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Let's get to it. This episode of the G Zero World podcast was made possible by Lennar, America's largest and most innovative home builder and the number one destination for foreign residential real estate investment in the U.S. Learn more at www.lenarg0.com. That's L-E-N-N-A-R-G-Z-E-R-O.com. Antonio Gutierrez, Secretary General of the United Nations, 75 years ago, born out of the crisis of World War II. It gave the Americans and others the gumption and the willingness to put together this idealistic institution that we all need. We have a crisis today. Is it helping? It's not yet clear whether it will help or whether it will further undermine the possibilities of multilateral institutions uh, to deliver. Uh, I think that we are now confronted with two kinds of attitude. Those that uh, uh, look at the COVID-19 and feel that it has shown the fragility of the world, fragility in relation to a pandemic, a microscopic virus that's put us on our, on our knees, fragility that would require us to be humble, uh, to understand that we need more unity, more solidarity, and that we need better governance in global affairs, which means to strengthen international cooperation. On the other hand, the, the same situation has led many people to think that, well, uh, what we need is to do it by ourselves. Let's deal with our problems and uh, forget about the others. Uh, this is a big crisis, so let's take care of ours. And uh, this is, of course, exacerbating feelings of uh, nationalism, of populism, uh, even of xenophobia and racism in uh, more extreme situations, and the denial of the need of multilateral governments and multilateral institutions. The two things are now confronting each other. This is, will be a very important ideological battle in the months to come. I'm on the side of those that believe that the world needs more governance, not less governance. But uh, I, uh, I am not uh, naive. And I know this is going to be a very tough ideological battle. We might come out of it uh, with the capacity to build back uh, a, a world with more uh, inclusive and sustainable perspectives, but we might come out of it uh, with a world where chaos be will become uh, the main logic of international relations. The direction we're heading in right now, uh, as, as you admit, is, is not towards stronger multilateralism, certainly and first and foremost in the technology sphere, but also in terms of broad governance, in terms of trade, in terms of geopolitical competition. Right now, we're heading in the direction that you don't want to see. What, what are the things, if they were to happen in the next months, that would give you a little more hope? That, that actually we're starting to turn the corner in, the other, in, in another direction? Some plausible things that you think could really occur? I think there are two main issues in the months to come. One is whether we will have or not vaccines and the treatments that can be considered a global public good. We see at the same time uh, initiatives uh, to bring uh, people together. We have seen statements by different countries that they would be ready to share whatever uh, it is produced by them. On the other hand, we see a competition in which several countries are trying to guarantee the vaccines for their own people. If there will be a vaccine that is effective, it's very important that that vaccine becomes a global public good, a people's vaccine, something that is affordable and accessible to everybody in the world, which I believe is in the interest of everybody because we will not be safe if the others will not be safe. And we have seen how the, the virus moves from east to west, now from north to south. And then uh, our people speak already of a second wave uh, potentially appearing in Europe. Uh, I mean, it is clear that never 
as today we need international cooperation and we have this question, the vaccine and some treatments that in my opinion are a problem and an opportunity. If this will become a problem, it will be a disaster. If this will become an opportunity and are still on time for that, it will be a very important signal of hope. And the second is the discussions that we are going to have uh, in 2020, early 2021, about climate change and the new national determined contributions. I am personally involved at the present moment in a very strong campaign, uh, uh, especially the big emitters, uh, to make sure that we move uh, clearly together into a commitment to carbon neutrality in 2050, which means to the 1.5 degrees limit at the end of the century. Um, and questions like coal, it is my deep belief that it doesn't make any sense to go on building coal-powered uh, 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 energy plants. Uh, and I've been uh, in dialogue from China to Japan to uh, Korea to uh, India uh, on this issue. I mean, everywhere we are spending trillions of dollars in the recovery from the COVID. Let's not spend them in subsidies to fossil fuels. When we bail out industries, let's do bailouts that at the same time create conditions related to the acceptance of a transition to uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, uh, when we uh, invest in the creation of jobs, let's recognize that today in renewable energies, you create three times more jobs than in any uh, fossil fuel industry. So again, it's a question. Are we going to change course or not? Or are we going to invest and rebuild exactly the kind of economy and society we had before? If we'll do it, we'll miss an opportunity. If, uh, if we are able to understand that things can be done differently, and many are already doing it differently, then I believe there is an important signal of hope. Well, because there are two so clearly global challenges. I mean, not only urgent and of scale, but also affecting every country in the world. And it's very clear that if you don't have that kind of collaboration and cooperation and leadership, on both of them that the responses are going to be substandard for everyone, right? Everyone gets hurt. And so it, it, is, it is in that regard, it's a message that you're uniquely positioned to actually deliver. And I'm trying my best to deliver it. I mean, and uh, we believe the next General Assembly will be a very important moment to discuss both the COVID, the need to uh, coordinate better in the response to the disease itself, the need to look into a vaccine as a people's vaccine, and at the same time, the need to reorganize the way we are uh, mobilizing our resources for a recovery uh, that, let's be clear, the developed countries are doing from the point of view of the mobilization of resources what needed to be done. They are mobilizing more than 10% of their GDP but the developing world is still not benefiting from enough solidarity, both in the transfer of resources and in the debt uh, restructuring and other aspects. So there is still a lot, and I hope the G20 will play a more active role on this. There is still a lot that needs to be done in order to make uh, the recovery more effective globally. But it's not only a question of the volume of resources and the equality in the way different countries are treated. It's a question of where are we going to spend the money, for what purpose, uh, with what orientation, with what strategy, and taking or not into account the need to indeed build a better, uh, a more inclusive and a more sustainable economy in the world. When you think about the drivers of chaos right now, is, it, is the US-China relationship the primary driver of decoupling, of confrontation, or are there others that are deeper, that are more systemic inside our societies that you're more worried about? I think that we are in a kind of a transition situation before we look into the Chinese-US relationship. We had the bipolar world, then we had the unilateral, uh, unipolar world uh, with a one only superpower, the United States. The 90s, I was prime minister of Portugal. I have witnessed very clearly. And then we moved into a situation that uh, tends to be multipolar, but it's not yet multipolar. It's rather chaotic, and power relations becoming less and less clear. And it is in this context that in itself is a driver of chaos that we have now the, the two largest economic powers. Uh, Russia is still a bigger military power than China, but the two largest economic powers that uh, risk to create a big rupture. And I say risk, I think we are not yet there. 
we are in a process that is still unpredictable and we'll have to see what happens in the next uh, two or three years to, to have a clear perspective of it. But the risk is there. And the risk is the risk to have two economies uh, with two sets of trade rules, uh, with two internets, uh, uh, with uh, uh, two different strategies for artificial intelligence, with two dominant currencies, and then to move based on that uh, into two geostrategic and military uh, uh, dimensions that could lead one day to a confrontation. I think we are still on time to avoid it. And I do still believe that um, it would be possible, uh, looking now uh, even beyond the United States, looking into the United States, Europe, Japan, and the, the so-called Western world that, to a certain extent, shaped the uh, economic uh, relations uh, of the past. Uh, I still think it's possible for this group of countries uh, to look uh, to China, to recognize that uh, the rules that were established uh, uh, when China uh, entered the World Trade Organization were rules that were still based on China seen as a developing country. So indeed, there are a number of areas in relation to intellectual property, in relation to trade itself, in relation to uh, access uh, investment, access to finance, um, uh, in which we need some rebalancing in these relations. And I do believe that if uh, the US, uh, Europe, Japan, if these countries would come to China and say, look, there is a system that to a certain extent is unbalanced in your favor because of the way it was designed one or two decades ago. There is a time we need to renegotiate this and to have a, a more balanced system in which in all these questions there is a set of rules that we all will be able to share. Then if that will happen, I think it will be possible. And I think China is ready to engage in this discussion. It will be possible to move into a situation in which we have one global economy with one set of rules and uh, uh, with, uh, um, I would say, trust being built to create conditions for in the most delicate aspects and the most delicate aspects are related to technology, in my opinion, artificial intelligence, uh, all, all these questions, in those aspects to have the possibility to have one single world and not the decoupling you were mentioning. Because if we decouple everything in the risk in the end, there is a risk of confrontation that is very, very dangerous. One place of optimism, at least so far, both on the vaccine, on the economic side, and on climate change seems to be Europe. The Europeans seem to be taking the lead on multilateralism on all of these issues right now. Am I right in that assessment? I believe Europe has understood that uh, the climate question is an existential question and is ready to lead, but Europe is not enough. We need to have the US, we need to have China, we need to have India, we need to have Japan, uh, Russia, uh, because uh, those are the countries that are the make it or break it in relation to the uh, capacity to reduce emissions. And we need to reduce emissions dramatically up to 2050. We have already, uh, it's important to say, 120 countries that have committed to carbon neutrality in 2050, but they only represent one fourth of the global emissions. So the big emitters are what matters now. And that's where the pressure needs to be put. And I'm happy Europe has recognized it and is leading in that way. Uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, in all these aspects that you mentioned, it is clear for me that we face a kind of an existential question. I mean, um, this pandemic is what it is but it kills relatively, a relatively small amount of the people in, infected. I mean, it's a lot of people, but it's a relatively small percentage. If you take Ebola, 50, 60, 70 percent of people die with Ebola. Of course, it's a different uh, virus, is uh, different in transmission. But we can have tomorrow another virus that instead of killing 2 percent of the population infected can kill 10, 20, 30 percent. We would be completely doomed. And climate change, again, I mean, if we go on uh, with uh, the present perspective, we'll come to the end of the century with three to five degrees increase. It will be devastating for, for the planet. So this is the moment in which there are basic choices that need to be made. And I'm optimistic that uh, some countries are recognizing it. More and more leaders are recognizing it and more. The business community is recognizing it. We see more and more asset managers uh, uh, representing trillions of dollars of assets moving into carbon neutrality. 
we see people uh, asking uh, uh, for uh, regulations establishing the need for disclosure in financial uh, uh, institutions. Uh, we need more and more uh, the need, uh, the idea that climate risks need to be taken into account when investments are programmed. And I, I now, to be honest, see the private sector moving more quickly than many governments. And this is a source of hope for me. Uh, and uh, when one look at the multilateralism of the future, we, we think about the multilateralism of the past was essentially intergovernmental. The multilateralism of the future must be much more multi-stakeholder. We need to give voice and institutional influence to businesses to society. Uh, we need to give uh, also more uh, voice to the cities, uh, to the regions of the world that today are where the, most of the decisions are taken. And we need to adapt our multilateral institutions to be more inclusive. And this means uh, that this is also an opportunity to change the power relations in relation to the different entities that we have in the international system and to uh, open up governments need to recognize that they, don't or they do not represent the monopoly of political action, to open up and to make other actors being also influential in the decisions that we'll have to take, both uh, for the pandemics that are to come, the climate change, the cyberspace, uh, and many other of the challenges that we face at the same time. Not only now, we need a stressed multilateralism, but we need a much more inclusive multi-stakeholder multilateralism. Now, that, that multi-stakeholder idea is something that people have been talking about for a while, but you're, you're certainly pushing it beyond uh, the, the reality of where we are today. If I, I, I think about some of the conversations you and I have had in the past, where you describe the potential for multinational corporations, for example, to become formal signatories of treaties, uh, to be, to be a actual full stakeholders. Is that, is that something that, you, for example, on climate, um, the United States pulls out of the Paris Climate Accord, but suddenly you'd have a whole bunch of other actors inside the United States that formerly were actually still in. Do you think that's something that is feasible in the near term? I think we will probably have less and less of the kind of treaties we had in the past, which were international treaties and conventions that would take 10 years to be negotiated and then were signed uh, during one or two years and ratified during two or three more years by parliaments all over the world and to move into more flexible instruments uh, in which we have a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, in which we have protocols, uh, best practices that are exchanged, uh, red lights that all uh, are ready to accept with flexibility because things are changing very quickly. I mean, if you look at technology, if you look at uh, the cyberspace, it's changing so quickly. If you do today a treaty, it, it, that treaty will no longer be valid in two years time. So you need to create more than a set of uh, rigid rules, you need to create a system of participation, of interaction, of cooperation, in which a number of entities are permanently able to discuss with each other. And that is where the UN can be a platform to bring people together, to discuss with each other and to establish a number of protocols, a number of norms, a number of best practices that can allow to transform these things that are either a threat or a huge potential, the digital world is an example of that, to, to, to make them essentially a force for good. And I do believe that in these uh, multinational corporations, but also uh, um, the, the, the different forms of association of the business community, but also the civil society, but also um, uh, if one looks cities, for instance, city, coalitions of cities can today take extremely important decisions. They are taking them in relation to climate. Uh, so so it's, it's a dual world with a, a different geography. And in this new world, in a different geography, you need to form mechanisms of governance that are at the same time more flexible, uh, less probably rigid in relation to the way things work, uh, um, but at the same time much more inclusive. And I believe uh, that there is no way to address the problems of digital technologies if you don't address them in a multi-stakeholder approach. I mean, the upside of that approach is, you know, if you end up with a government that doesn't do very much or a couple of countries that are fighting, it doesn't matter as much if you actually have all these institutions inside their countries that are still able to work together and engage flexibly. The downside is there are a lot of um, authoritarian governments out there that are not necessarily going to be really happy about ceding power and creating flexibility for people that might have very different ideas of what sort of agreements they'd like to get into than the government up top. 
well, this is not going to be easy, but I see things moving and I see things changing. And uh, uh, for instance, when we discuss the role of uh, the business community in these questions, I see that countries that were totally opposed to it a few years ago, now understanding that it will be needed. So I'm cautiously optimistic about the possibility to progressively move into a more inclusive multilateralism. It will take time, it will be done in different ways. In some aspects, we'll have variable geometries, in some aspects, we'll have different speeds, but I feel this is the direction of the future. And I mean, what needs to be, needs to be. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this is a necessity. There is no way uh, we can look at today's world based on uh, a, a strict analysis of what's happening, uh, considering that only governments are the interlocutors in the international sphere. And where would you say um, you have the most engagement, interest, strength in non-state actors to proactively be a part of that? Interestingly enough, in my opinion, now the financial sector is moving more quickly than any other one. And, uh, on climate, think, for example. On cli yeah. And I think there is a reason for that. If you own assets, yeah. and if you own assets in the fossil fuels, you understand that the value of those assets in 10 or 20 years' time will be smaller. And, uh, <laughs> and if that is the case, you will tend to uh, uh, reduce your investments in the areas that have no future, and increase your investments in the areas that inevitably will become the areas of the future, be it in the digital world, be it in relation to the green economy. So uh, uh, it is very interesting to see how the financial sector is now becoming much more active and much more uh, pressing than even the traditional industrial sectors that, of course, to, to be frank, they always will pay much of the uh, costs of the transition. Uh, uh, but this push of the financial sector and uh, my special envoy uh, on climate action and, and on finance, uh, Mark Carney, has been extremely active on pushing both for the action of the actors and for regulations at the level of the financial systems. I believe that um, uh, they can be a very important accelerator of the changes that are needed. Now, another one of your advisors has said that uh, diplomacy is a contact sport. And I'm wondering, you know, as we look forward to this uh, General Assembly, how much are you losing because we're not able to get the heads of state together in person? How much are you personally losing because you're not able to be on a plane and engaged physically the way we are normally? Inevitably a lot. It's clear. I mean, uh, we are doing our best in diplomacy. We are trying to end the conflict in Yemen. There is a ceasefire that goes in and off uh, in uh, Libya. Sudan, we had this peace agreement. But of course, it's much easier to do diplomacy and it's much easier to solve conflicts when you are able to physically contact people and to put everybody together in the same room uh, for uh, sometimes one or two or three days. Now everything is virtual and it's much more complex, it's much more difficult. So there is indeed, uh, it would be naive uh, to pretend it's not the case, uh, there is a huge loss in the efficiency of diplomacy for the fact uh, that this lockdown doesn't allow us to be together and especially doesn't allow to use this General Assembly for a multiplication of contacts that would be extremely helpful because we have a number of situations of conflict in different parts of the world where you need to put together a number of vectors in order to make sure that we have a breakthrough um, to, uh, to move in the direction of a consolidated ceasefire and peace. Is there, as we think ahead about, I mean, how much the geopolitical order has changed, how much the challenges have changed, how quickly they're happening, and yet the institutional framework is much more as it has been for decades now. Aside from reforms and efficiency, is there new architecture that you believe we need that needs to be created? I think this is, uh the most difficult part, because it goes into the center of power relations, and power relations are the most difficult to change. But I, I do believe that the present architecture is in many aspects outdated. And, uh, and especially, we need to make the architecture correspond to what the world is today. The architecture we have is still largely corresponding to what the world was after the Second World War. You see it in the Security Council, you see it in the Bretton Woods system. So, it would be useful 
to have uh, 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 an improved architecture. Uh, in the absence of that, what I've been trying to um, push for is to have a, a much stronger interconnection of different multilateral institutions. And uh, fortunately, we are moving in that direction. I mean, today the UN works much more closely with uh, the uh, IMF and the World Bank. We had today a meeting of ministers of finance sponsored by the UN with the participation of the IMF and the World Bank. This would be inconceivable just uh, two or three years ago. Um, the same with the regional organizations, the cooperation between the UN, the African Union, and the UN and the EU, just to give two examples, is today exemplary. Uh, at the same time, linking those things with the aspects uh, of trade, uh, linking those things with the aspects of technology. Uh, I mean, we need to make sure, in the absence of a, of a change in the structures, to make the present structures be much more flexible and mobile, interacting with each other and working closely together. But of course, let's be clear, what we have today in the Security Council or we have today in the Bretton Woods system is not what corresponds to the political relations in the world and the political power distribution in the world or uh, with the, the global economy as, uh, as, uh, as it exists uh, in the present times. But I know that it will be much more difficult to change architecture and we should not be waiting to change architecture to make things move. I think that we need to be firm in trying to say what we need to do in relation to architectural reform, but uh, we need to be active and engaged in improving whatever can be improved, because what matters is to change the lives of people for the better. As you see the Chinese creating Belt and Road, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, a lot of new institutions and architecture that didn't exist before, do you view this as something that should help stimulate the rest of the world to say, hey, we need more and better global architecture because the Chinese aren't incorporated the way they should be. Look at what happens otherwise. Is this the beginning of what could be uh, a new global order? Or is this something that we are likely to ignore? Well, at, at the present moment, uh, I don't think that this is uh, moving in the direction of a stronger cooperation. But it is clear that if one country uh, has uh, a global project uh, of infrastructure and probably of infrastructure, other countries that compete with this should be doing something. I mean, and sometimes people talk too much and do too little. Uh, but uh, when in our relations with China, we are also the ones telling them, look, I mean, in the Belt and Road, uh, we want to support countries in order to make sure that those countries uh, do have a positive impact of these projects in their economies and their societies. That those, those projects are not, to a certain extent, linked to a global strategy of uh, mobility, uh, but they are really a support to the development of countries. And then there are debt questions that need to be discussed, as you know. And then there is the question of the green aspect of uh, infrastructure and projects. We have been telling the Chinese, as the Japanese, as the Koreans, that we do not agree with the, the trend to go on financing coal power plants uh, uh, in the developing world. It doesn't make sense anymore. It's not profitable. We are moving to those countries, assets that will become stranded assets, and that are not the most profitable way to produce energy uh, in the developed countries. So we need to help the developing world move to the green economy and not try to keep the developing world uh, in the uh, energies of the past. So Antonio, as Secretary General, who's more frustrating? Who's more of an obstacle to deal with? The Americans that think we have the answers for absolutely everything, or the Chinese that feel like they're being excluded by the West? Neither is frustrating. Everything is a challenge, for, and we need, to, we need to talk to everybody, and we need to discuss with everybody, and we need to bring everybody together, knowing that there are huge differences, huge political systems, huge conceptions about uh, many other aspects. But the truth is, the challenges we face are such, our fragility is such, either we do it together or we are doomed. Antonio Gutierrez, great to see you and hope you have a very successful couple weeks at the General Assembly. Thank you very much and all the best. That's it for today's edition of the G0 World Podcast. Like what you've heard? I hope so. Come check us out at g0media.com and sign up for our newsletter, Signal. This episode of the G0 World podcast was made possible by Lennar. 
America's largest and most innovative home builder and the number one destination for foreign residential real estate investment in the U.S. Learn more at www.lenarg0.com. That's L-E-N-N-A-R-G-Z-E-R-O.com. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.